So good morning everybody, welcome to ACORN. My name is Jane, um, I've been involved in ACORN for over a year now. Um, and um, we're just a small group of energetic people who get together weekly and we co-work and we have guest presenters and we also run a business mastermind once a month where we help each other out on what are our business, what are the issues we have with our businesses and um, you know, how, what, how can we share our knowledge with each other. And this morning I'm really excited to have Kate here, very kindly come to talk to us about storytelling in business, which I find, I'm really excited about because I think it's a really interesting subject because how we communicate what we do and what our business is about to our potential clients and the people that we serve is a really, really interesting challenge. I know a lot, come, come in, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. For so many of us, actually being able to clearly communicate what our business is about and our, what our story is, it has been a real challenge. So thank you very much for making the time to be here with us today, Kate. Over to you. All right, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, I would like to begin um, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're gathered on, the um, uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And to, um, I suppose, remember and uh, honour the fact that they have told stories and gathered in circles for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, and to invite you to take a breath, which I do as much for me as for anyone else, and come into your body and to being here and present. Um, we have lots of stuff that's probably happened this morning already and there'll be things to go to but let's um, just make the most of our time together and I also like to kind of just acknowledge the earth that's underneath us, hold us, ground us. Um, so I will have a look at my notes to see what I intended to say next. Uh, first I'd really like to go around and get names, I won't remember names but I might um, make a little note and um, if you can say just one word about how you are at this minute, how you're travelling, how you're feeling, that would be excellent. Will you start, Jane? Sure. Jane? And I'm fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> she got a good park. Fucking berries. I'm Sean, and I'm ready to absorb all learning soon. Hi, I'm Rena, and I'm great because I got the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Craig and uh, I'm fantastic too. I've, uh, we had a Women in Business luncheon last Friday and we've done and dusted that and it went really well so uh, I'm feeling good moving forward. My name is Aisha and I feel grounded today because yeah. I'm Lynn and I feel refreshed. Meet new people. I'm Corey and I'm enthusiastic. I'm Jenny and I'm energised. I'm Matthias and I think I'm challenged. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Lisa and I feel excited. Mm. Fantastic, you are all brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful, thank you. Um, so uh, storytelling's innate in humans. It's part of our DNA. We all tell stories all the time. It, it is a stretchy word and we'll talk a little bit about you know, which word we're talking about. But um, we speak in narrative, that's how we explain to our friends and family what's happened to us. And when we have a big story, um, we do this all the time, but it's more noticeable when we have a story, something significant has happened to us, and we tell that story over and over again. We tell it to our mum, we tell it to our partner, we tell it to our friends. And each time we're telling that kind of story, there's a little part of our brain that is unconsciously kind of seeing how the story is landing. If someone laughs, then the next time we might sort of ramp that up a little bit, see if we can get a bigger laugh. Or if someone's a bit shocked, we might even make that more dramatic or we might close it down if we didn't like the reaction. And often we're doing that unconsciously, but what we do when we um, become a storyteller is to consciously look at that process and to look at how we shape and present a story about what's happened to us for a purpose often. And humans have been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. We tell stories for history, religion, to explain things, to teach lessons, morals, um, to entertain and to not feel so alone. And to sell or to present why we do what we do. Uh, and that's what we're here for um, today. Um, 
it's a really tight, like this is going to fly by in an hour. So um, I do two day workshops. I could talk about this for hours. So you'll only get little bits and pieces. Um, and it is interactive. I'll talk for quite a bit at the start, but ultimately um, I'm going to be inviting you to choose a moment from your uh, lives and that relates to your business or your purpose or whatever you're doing and get you in pairs sharing that. Uh, and hopefully we'll do that more than once so that you get a little bit of practice at telling that story. And um, I would also invite you, I say this now just in case I forget, but I'll, I'll keep trying to remember it, but when you do come to do that pairs work, stick your phone on and record yourself. Mm -hmm. Because then you'll have captured in an oral version something that you might want to write down and refine and finesse. And you'll capture it, if you do it twice, you'll, 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 you'll get the differences. Because sometimes in the flow of things, words come and they sound great and we want to remember those. Um, so, um, uh, as I said, uh, story is a very stretchy word from anything that might be in a full-on movie to a, you know, very well-crafted personal story to an anecdote about your cat vomiting this morning. Um, and we're, um, we're going to focus on um, uh, purpose because purpose is crucial in, in good storytelling and cat vomiting anecdote often doesn't have a purpose unless we're using it in a metaphor. But so there's this level of storytelling where we tell to simply be heard, to, to, to explore our experiences, and then there's this next level where we're crafting. And purpose is crucial in that crafted, but no more so than in business. It, 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 telling stories in business absolutely needs to have a purpose, and it needs to have a relevant purpose. Um, and a purpose that, you know, the closer you can get to it being meaningful to why people have come to hear you, the better it, it's going to be. Um, the best stories have emotion, but um, in business sometimes a good case study will pass as a story or an example. It's still narrative, it's still um, embodied and in people's lived experience as opposed to abstract. Um, to be perfectly honest, I haven't taught business storytelling. I have taught a lot of storytelling. Um, I've done a lot of storytelling both folk and historical and personal. And so it was a great challenge for me, because I have a business, to then um, look at and apply to myself. I'm gonna tell a story in a minute that um, uh, I've prepared that I'll, I'll be using later. Um, but uh, today we will focus on personal storytelling, partly because it's what I have experience in but also um, people really do want to know who you are and personal storytelling it, it embodies that. But if you want to explore a story that's to do with your business or your some invention or some product, it's, this, this process is here to serve you, not uh, me. The structure of story applies, the, the, ben, the good parts of a good story are, are applicable whether you're talking about a product or whether you're talking about um, yourself. Um, and we'll focus on oral storytelling uh, because it helps your writing. It helps um, you be real in your writing. Um, I'm, I'm worried about talking too much. There, there's lots of in business storytelling. There's a lot, every book you pick up will have its own taxonomy of stories. And for example, Annette Simmons, who wrote The Story Factor, which is one of the original kind of storytelling in the workplace books. She says there's six stories. Other books will say there's 12, some will say there's four. Uh, just to look at what she says, she says, who am I, why am I here? Your vision story, your values and action story, teaching stories, and I know what you're thinking stories. I am not so hung up on taxonomy, and I think that often one story can do all of those things, and one story is imminently, um, it's like plasticine, and you're gonna go and, uh, tell it in a keynote speech or as a workshop and you can you know stretch it out to five or ten minutes you're pitching in a two minute pitch and you're going to make it 10 seconds if you can like it's that's really hard um so but your audience and the purpose of your story must always be at the forefront of your mind in um, getting ready to tell it so i'm going to tell this story uh it as i say it's at the moment, it's way too long. And I've even, you know, even cut it in half on the way here. It's like, get rid of all of that. Uh, 
But for about 15 years ago, I was uh, a legal aid lawyer and I was based at Sunshine Magistrates Court and my job was to sit in this small, white-walled, windowless office and to see the long list of people who were fronting court that day. It's a very modern building. It's a bit more like an airline terminal than a courthouse, the Sunshine Court. And most of the people would be pleading guilty and so my job was to gather information to then speak on their behalf in court to get the judge to soften the penalty. And one day I had this guy come in, he was probably late 30s and he was facing his second drink driving charge, which the court takes very seriously. And he came in and he sat down and I started to ask questions, looking at his history. He said, I don't want any excuses. I did this, I'm guilty. I, you know, I don't want any excuses given to the court. So I spent a bit of time explaining to him that I wasn't looking for excuses, but that we were looking for understanding and that the court would want to understand. And so then I did my usual you know, poking and prodding and prying, really. I was in a very privileged position to ask intrusive questions about someone's personal life in order to then take that into court. And, and he sat there with his head bowed and he stared at the floor and he had this sort of faraway sound to his voice as he we spiralled down through his history and he talked about the marriage breakdown and the um, his mother dying and the troubles at work and the increased drinking and oh and I noticed that you know he was 12 when his parents had separated and his oldest child was now 12 and it all culminated in this perfect storm where he was facing court for this behaviour and um, he uh, it, it, the court was the wake up call that he needed and he knew that so we I put it all together and we went into the court and I did my best to explain this this significant story and, and because I'd watched in that room as waves of understanding and realisation had crossed his face as he put the pieces together and he now he'd sort of almost taken the thumbtacks out of the thing that he was beating himself with and he had a little bit of context and a little bit of understanding for his own life. And I tried to convey this to the judge and the judge just went, Phew! it went straight over his head. Yep, sure, same standard time off the road, standard fine, let's move on. So that was a little, you know, the air coming down out of the balloon. But outside the court, as I shook his hand to say goodbye and explain a little bit about what the, the penalty meant, you know, we, we, we had this moment of connection. I. We really knew that something far more meaningful had occurred uh, and it had nothing to do with what had happened in the courtroom. Um, and I tell his story, but it's not an aberration. It was, it was typical. That was the process that I engaged in in, the court, in, the, in, that, in that room in order to explain people's lives. And um, sometimes judges heard and it, you know, it landed with them and they address it when they spoke to the, the, the defendant facing court. But too often it just, it just went flying by and the magistrate and the court missed the point. And I think they missed their purpose in the work that they were there to do and, and my work as well, which was to see the humanity of the person facing the court. To be rendered invisible, to um, be dismissed, to bear an untold story, uh, to not be uh, heard is one of the cruelest things we can do to people. We know that children um, will muck up, will be naughty, will risk getting penalised in order to get attention rather than have no attention. We all need to be seen and heard and to feel like we matter. Which brings me to the work that I do now in organisations. We spend an enormous amount of time working in our adult lives and a lot of us spend that time in organisations. And so I've pulled together um, that experience with the law, but also I went on to be a facilitator, design group process, a storyteller and um, create a, an organisational program that creates story as part of the culture of an organisation so that we have places to be heard, to emotionally express ourselves, to be authentic, to have reflective time and to then share that. So because um, we shouldn't have to go to court to look at our lives and to be heard. So that's the story. It's too long and it's, you know, I've got, um, uh, you know, some finessing around the edge, but I thought I wanted to tell a story so that we could see 
where you you know what what my approach is to storytelling um you know in a pitch i'm going to have to somehow reduce that and get that emotional heart of that story which is really hard but when i started it was a probably a 12 minute story and you know i'm getting there getting there getting there it's a work in progress um so I want to now talk about some of the elements of story so that you and um, so that you know what you're looking for when you're thinking about your history. Um, a story, the most the biggest thing a story needs to have and the biggest mistake we often make is that it must have a scene. We have to people have to see something, a place, a person because we live in moments. And so often we tell stories that are um, skating across the surface. And I could have told that skating across the surface and said that's what happened with lots of clients. But I needed, in order to emotionally connect with you, in order for you to see and to really be in the moment where I felt what I felt, I have to take you into a place. And so that's the most important thing that I, I want to get across. Um, uh, it, it needs to have emotion. Uh, emotion really is the thing that we can relate to. Um, that is the universal, that is the heart, that is the connection and the thing that we'll remember. It's also the scene that we'll remember because you'll all have some, it'll all be different, but you'll all have some scenes from that story I told, whether it's in that office with the guy staring at the ground or whether it's standing in the court or whether it's outside when I'm shaking his hand and we look at each other in the eye. You'll all have some scene or image and that's what sticks with people. Um, so, uh, the other significant thing is that it needs a point. It needs to segue into your purpose in business. And um, so I've segued that. It's a little rough and it'll get smoother. Um, and the other thing that it will have that you want to recognise is that there's a theme or values underpinning. So this, the values underpinning that story I told is about is about my approach to treating humans as as valuable and and. Um, seeing the human that's before you. So that's a value underpinning that story. Uh, and you'll have values underpinning your stories and they're really important. Um, you know, Simon Sinek's always sort of, people do it by what you do, they buy why you do it. People do it by what you do, they buy why you do it. And that's embedded in the values that's in your story. So um, any questions so far? You're no longer a legal aid. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the in the longer version of the story, I, you know, I talk about leaving the law, but yes, I, I um, mm -hmm. yeah. And how long should a story be? If you're saying that's too long, I mean, you had us all engaged and it was all fine, but I guess if you're in an elevator going up the yeah. elevator pitch story. Yeah, the, look, elevator pitches are different from storytelling. Mm. They really are. Like, um, this is the sort of storytelling that I think you might use um, in, and I, I can condense it down, I have done, but I would not get the emotional heart of that story. Um, you know, I have talked about um, when I was a lawyer being, you know, in a really privileged position to ask very intrusive questions of people and I would watch as they got it inside. Yeah, it's super yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, you know, it at least gives some context to who I am, but it's not a story for me. Yeah. Um, uh, and so we're not, we're not here to learn about pitching. Um, but, you know, getting people engaged in a really short amount of time, it depends on the context, mm -hmm. it depends where you're, if you're, if you're in an elevator, I would be just going straight to the what you do. Um, uh, and the why, you know, is almost a visionary story. Um, this kind of story would depend if I have a 20 minute window, you know, I might be prepared to take five minutes. And, and that story I can easily get down to five minutes. It might, I, I'm not sure how, you know, it's probably around six. Sometimes when I yeah. tell it, it's eight. Um, but uh, often in pictures, you, you know, I'm wanting to get that down to three. And I, I think I can get that down to three. But it is the build up that takes us to the emotional heart of story. Um, mm. And as a storyteller, I also have a little bit more leeway because I'm talking about story. I think I have a little bit more leeway to. In, to ask my audience to indulge in listening to the story, mm -hmm. um, because I want to, I want to show my wares in a way. Mm. I actually have a question, and 
maybe we might need to take this outside of here as a question, but I was really intrigued by your comment about moving from the unconscious to the conscious mm -hmm. in terms of the storytelling. So it's kind of like the, pra the practice and paying attention to this, what you were already doing, but doing it consciously and paying attention to how people react. Yeah. And being thoughtful about how you might then tweak the yep. story yep. based on the response, whether you got what you got the response you wanted or not. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just interested, is there anything more you can tell us about that moving from the unconscious to the conscious? Is it? It's, it's what anyone who addresses people, you're learning to read an audience. Yeah. And you're, you do it in one-on-one, -on -one, but as a storyteller, there's a, there's a listening that happens with storytelling. I'm listening. I, I can feel when you are with me in the story. And if I'm telling a story and a little worm of doubt gets in my head, and I'm going, oh, they're not listening, or she's nodding off, and then I, you know, then I sound like a wooden, and then I just start to lose people. You know, it's it's a downward spiral from there. I've learned to rise. You know, you you learn. It's a, it's an art of listening to the story, um, listening to your audience, and reading your audience. And and the same story told the same way can fall like a flat pancake in one audience if you're not reading it, or um, than than another. So. It's it's something that you get with experience, but it is about being conscious. But you're always got an audience. You're you're <coughs> always in conversation yeah. with your audience, even if they're just listening. They're showing, and and there's a part of you that's um, yeah listening. So starting with the conversations and 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 becoming more aware of how you uh, watch how people are receiving what you're speaking is is a um, you know that's a communication. Eye contact's often a real key, right? If, Absolutely. If they're actually engaged, they're looking at you, and as soon as they start looking away from you, you realise that kind of, you've gone taken too much time or yeah. they've disconnected unless from what you in conversation. Unless they're thinking about what you said. Yeah, or I unless know that you say something and I'll go, oh, how does that apply to me? That's not necessarily losing me. Mm -hmm. Or is it? I don't know. Uh, say that again, sorry. Well, if, if you if you give me an example and then I sit there and internalise it thinking, well, how did that apply to me? I'm going to look away. That does I mean, that might mean you, I've lost, you've lost me for that minute, but it's, yes. but I'm engaged in But you can tell that. Yeah. You know, we can yeah. tell that. You can tell when someone's looking beyond you and scanning the room, like, <laughs> I just want to punch them in the face. <laughs> um, Anyway, I'll keep going because I want you to get some of the basics of uh, the story structure. So I'm going to do this on the um, board because it helps to get a visual. So some of you may have studied this at school. It's always good to have it um, reminded. I didn't study it at school. I don't know why. I never taught us the basics of storytelling. Um, but story has, and this looks, it, it, loads of different people have different uh, parts to story, but essentially it, um, I kind of do it in this type of shape sometimes people have it going up and up and up there's five parts the first part is set the scene and um, that is where you um, well I'll start I like to start so you start with a moment and the moment is usually the climactic point which is here that's what you when you start um, thinking about your story and often people say I've got no stories and I would say that too for many many years I'd say I've got no stories and if you ask me to tell you a story on the spot I, my mind goes blank because I'm, I'm kind of like, good to know absolutely because I'm looking for this thing that's got a little label saying story yeah, it's got a big beginning middle and end and it's all neatly wrapped up but that's not how stories work they start from tiny mm. moments and we build them out and we create a world and, and, and memory begets memory and that's why you need to practice this and, and it, it's a craft. Um, so you start with this, this moment and then you have to set the scene, you have to create the world where that moment, this moment might be an epiphany for you that if you just told someone this, they go, yeah, so what? <laughs> but you're taking us on a journey so that this moment we're there with you, we're feeling what you were feeling and we're in this world. So when we set the scene, we're orientating to people, place, and, and time and context. Um, and you can do that with a few choice um, descriptors. So I used a few choice descriptors about that man. I could have gone into detail, but I just talked about him being in his late 30s. I, I, I tried to give you a sense of him being in this 
reverie, because that's the image I remember of this man staring at the floor as he was thinking about his history. Um, I also tried to give you a sense of place, but just mentioning it's a bit, you know, using a metaphor, it's a bit more like a, an airport um, scene. So that gives you something to think about, big spaces, long sort of corridors. Um, and time and context. Uh, I think I mentioned it was about 15 years ago and then, you know, my role there. Then, um, then you have this, this is, this is, uh, this is where, this is the, like it's invariably known as the inciting incident or the, the, essentially something happens one day. So you create the world and then you go one day. And I created the world very quickly and then one day this, this 30 year old man walked in. So I'm still kind of setting the scene, but he's, you know, you're morphing between setting the scene and the inciting incident, which is him um, not wanting to tell me about, uh, you know, his history, then we go through, then we have this series of, um, this is the, the next bit, which is the rising action. So from the one day, we get a series of things and you'll, you know, there's a whole ton of things that might be in here. Your job in crafting is to choose what's relevant, is to choose only what's relevant to create the context where the climax is climactic. And um, the more you, you know, I know that with that, that story, even as I was driving here this morning, practicing it, and I was thinking about our conflict, right? So I, I wrapped up in the story, the magistrates, like dismissing of that. I, I made it, I just, I just expanded, I just made it more important. So you're always kind of um, expand, you know, honing in on whatever is dramatic and making it more dramatic. Making, because you're, you're always got this seesaw of tension between there was a good something happened and then there was a bad something happened. There was a good something happened and a bad something happened. And the, the, the gooder it is, the badder it is. Like, and, and that, you know, expanding the gap between the good and the bad is your dramatic tension. That's your story. So, and, and, so, and, and you know, that happens with practice. It's a practice. It's an art. And then the hardest, absolutely. So this is for the climactic moment and it's, um, uh, Sometimes it's an all is lost moment. Like th that then became, so in that story I told, it's almost like the magistrate dismissing and not hearing is the climactic moment. But it's taken me a little while to realise that's the climactic moment in this story. Um, because I'm, yeah, because of where I'm going. And then the fifth point is the resolution of the story. And this is by far, and then with business, you're kind of transitioning into uh, an Sure. I wondered about that. I'm a bit loud. <laughs> I used to shut the door in my office when I was on the phone with clients. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, so this part is where you're you're leading into your business purpose um, and why you do what you do. And um, it, 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 even, even in, if you don't have a business purpose, this resolution is the hardest part of the storytelling. It's where you land. It's like you've taken us up on this journey and you have to bring us down to this, this sort of satisfying hole that is a good story, where we go, yes, that is how life is, yes. Um, and, and so the resolution has um, usually hope in it and the hope might be your business offering is the hope. Um, uh, it depends on, you know, it depends on a lot of things as to what, what your story um, is or how it is. But as soon as you, and I don't, you know, with the story I just told, at some point where we've left story and we're in me lecturing you about humanity, where, you know, I'm starting to talk about people need to be um, heard. and So I'm, we're out of story. You'll tolerate that because it's a business story. But I would rarely, uh, yeah, um, unless I'm heading in this direction, I, I wouldn't have been so obvious with it. But you have that option as business people. People are wanting you to, to then be, to move out of pictures and, and lived experience into um, analysis or solution or to the other side of your brain. Um, so, 
The other two things that are sort of um, uh, part of storytelling is, is the beginning. So, sorry, that's a bit of a spill. Knowing how you're starting your story is really helps you orient yourself, but also helps your, your audience orient themselves and you want to grip them uh, from the beginning. Some people start here. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to be a very literal narrator. Uh, I go in uh, chronological order. But some people start here and will go back there. There's lots of different creative ways. I would suggest you start chronologically until you've um, uh, got a sense of how you might want to play around with it. But either way, the beginning of your story is significant because um, often once you start the beginning and, and, and and often you'll maybe have two or three things you want to say at the beginning and you need to remember, you need to practice and remember them. And the other is, is the ending. So I'm trying to end my story and I haven't quite got the right words, but I will get very set words about ending my story and it's to do with, uh, and I've played around with it, you know, so people shouldn't have to go to court to be heard and, or, or you know, something along those lines. I'll get a, a neat little landing phrase um, that uh, will bring the story home. Well, that's the aim of it anyway. So, any questions now? In context, would you use storytelling? Context? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm thinking the story that I... So, if you're going to present to yeah. someone about your service or your business, um, if you're, uh, there's, there's, yeah, there's, it's really, you can write it up and use yeah. it in any kind of materials that you use. You can use it as a social media thing. You could record yourself telling your story um, and put it on your website. Uh, you, yeah, so there, it depends on your, on your, yeah. your um, it's a great skill uh, to develop um for, for uh, you know to, to develop so that whenever you want to you can you can use it and there uh, metaphors are close cousin of story and metaphor is really powerful um, and use its descriptive language depends on your situation yeah um, do you have any particular books or if somebody want to learn more about storytelling yes I will um, I'll, I'll write a hand up hand up Oh, uh, and I'll have some books on there that are useful. Yeah. So now I um, now I'd really like. You, well, again, any questions? Um, like you, when you're mentioning, it can be a book where some an author has written something and is taking us through a journey. So and also you're talking about when you are speaking, and we are able to receive the other person's uh, point of view as well. So in the whole journey that we discussed here, it's usually uninterrupted speaking. How do you factor in if somebody is interrupting with more insights into it? How yeah, you know? so it's more conversational. Um, that is hard because storytelling and story listening really go together. Um, it, it just becomes more conversational and you stop your story mid and then if they're still listening, but it may be that you're completely derailed and the conversation goes off in another direction. Um, this sort of storytelling, I suppose, is in order to get to the point where you have a story, you have to craft the story and practice the story or think about how you're going to present the story. And then if you're interrupted and if you know your story well enough, you'll easily get back into the point where you, you're going to go. Um, and it will uh, be as successful as the context that it's in. Um, yeah. And uh, do you keep multiple stories? Like, uh, should a business person have multiple stories at the back of their mind and understand the audience first and then bring out the best thing that suits them? Like you mentioned, the people, place, time, and the context based on these to say what makes sense to them and then go about it or would you recommend saying the story to multiple people knowing that uh, okay the whole set of people are not my audience I will definitely match with maybe a section of the whole crowd and they will definitely listen to me 
So I should not be thinking about where I'm pitching, mm. but what I'm pitching about. Yeah, I think that, that from what um, I understand about pitching and um, presenting to an audience that you, you want to bring as many people on the journey as you can. Story will capture nearly everyone, a good story, well told. Uh, it's when you move into the, the purpose and the business and the intention of your presentation that you know, you're only going to resonate with so many people. And they, yeah, you're addressing the people who you're, you're going to resonate with the most. In terms of your first question, um, which was about having a series of stories in the back of your head, absolutely. Um, and they, uh, they might be very tiny moments and stories um, and they're really sort of anecdotes or illustrations or and, and that's what I was talking about about how any business book you read will have these this taxonomy of stories um, and I'll, I'll you know again I'll go because they don't vary too much from um, Annette Simmons taxonomy which is but, but but I tend to think you know if I look at the story I told I think it tells you uh, about who I am um, um, you know about why I'm here. It, it tells. It, it, uh, I mean, it's. It could have more on the vision. You know, I could. I could talk more about the my vision for how my program would unfold in an organisation. So I could have more a visionary uh, story to it. But vision ultimately is 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 fiction. You know, we're, we're making up a possible future. Uh, so it's a different kind of storytelling. It's clearly got my values in action. Um, it's not so much a teaching story. I, I, you know, I do have a lot of teaching stories. Uh, it's not really a I know what, I'm, what you're thinking story. So, so all the business storytelling writers have their own lists. I don't have a list. I do think that some of the, the choices that you have, and sometimes they're either or, and sometimes they're just a, a shade. You know, you've got a choice between telling your personal story and be telling the story of your business. Mm -hmm. Um, or the story of a product or, your, or a service, which it gets harder to embed the human factor in those stories without it being your story. Um, you, you have a choice between telling your own story and a customer story or telling your story and a research or a data story. Again, they're, they're choices you can make. Um, you, I think, I don't know if these are choices, but there's a values um, problem, like looking at your client's problem and talking, telling a story about the problem and how you solve the problem uh, or the vision. Um, you can tell a, a, you can make a fable, you know, you can tell a fictional fable type story um, as, or you can even tell a folk tale or a wisdom story that reflects, you know, what's something that you want to say, you know, starfish on the beach kind of um, uh, and you're you're always working with the log with the with the tension, I suppose, between logic. Stories have to have really strong logic. They have to make sense, um, which took me a long time to realise. But 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 also the thing that is memorable are, are images, scenes, seeing something, and emotions, um, which is really hard to do in two minutes mm -hmm. or three minutes. Um, there's a great, uh, I'll, I'll put this on the um, uh, handout, but there's a great uh, podcast called An from, from, from Anecdote, uh, which is a Melbourne-based storytelling um, consultancy. Uh, and they have, every week they, whatever they do, they have, you know, they have little stories and you can, you can take their stories and use them and if they resonate. Um, but again, so then, then you're not crafting so much. Then you're learning how to tell a story with, with um, your using your voice, using your um, uh, your own language, using metaphor, um, and that's a that's a next level of telling your story. But I really want you to have a go because um, I, you know, that you won't learn if you don't do it. Um, and so, does everyone? Um, so I'll just quickly. So what you're looking for when you're looking for a storytelling moment is something that's pivotal, something that's a turning point, something that's like an epiphany, um, some journey where you change. Um, failures are great uh, food for stories. 
where something you want something that's at stake or something where there was high emotion. It might be from six months ago, six years, or when you were six. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, and uh, um, as I've mentioned, memory, you know, you pull on a thread and the memories, the memories come. Sometimes um, so stories have a way of actually choosing themselves. Um, often I've had people say, oh, look, I, I didn't want to do a business story, but I told you this story and it's got nothing to do with my business or my work. And find me down if it isn't like the most perfect example. They just they, they couldn't see it, but the story knew, and the story. So I urge you to listen if there's a story that is pushing inside you, saying, "Come in, come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. <laughs> um, because you know there's something in it that will either surprise you that you needed to hear from yourself, from your history, or surprise you in in, in proving to be particularly. Um, relevant that you couldn't see and that it might be a metaphor or it might be some other way. Um, so uh, does everyone have something that they can work with? All right, so just take a couple of minutes to jot down, um, maybe going through this if it, if it works for you. Some people say, oh, that just, like, I thought I had a story and now I've got to fit it into this. It just confuses me. You don't have to worry about that, but just take a couple of minutes to jot down because then I'm going to send you off uh, in pairs to share your story. So just a couple of minutes to sort of dwell in your memory, make any notes about the, the moment. As long as everyone's got a moment, does everyone have a moment to work with? Then just pick turning point moment from your life. Huge, small, um, some memory that you think would be good to share. Think in particular about how you're going to segue from your story to your business, to your product, to your service, to why you do what you do. exercise twice it just might take us a little bit beyond 11 because um, it's it's 10:47, and you probably need 10 minutes in one pair and then 10 minutes in another pair to swap and tell your story twice um, but it does help to tell it again to a different set of ears it just helps you shape it and change it and have a practice uh, so if that's okay then um, that's what uh, I'll do the timing of um, Andre, are you going to join in doing this? Um, are there even numbers? No. 
Right. There are, I can do it, the, yeah. it make up the even yeah. numbers, or you can yeah, record it. Okay. Okay. You will, or me? I'll, I'll record it. So okay. So I've got to go. Oh, okay. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 that's fine. All right, we've got even numbers. All right, so, um, so yeah, find, yeah, just find a pair. Find a space in the room because it will get a bit noisy and um, standing uh, sometimes helps you tell the story better, but it's sort of up to you. Yeah, able to get in pairs yourselves. Oh, and record, <laughs> remember to, if you can, put your phone here and tell your story just... No, no, you're just telling from audio. You can you can check your notes, but um, uh, you know I don't want you to write it. You are doing something that I spent days doing, so you know just tell it as it was and have a play and a practice and record it so that you've got a record of it for later. world this is how life is and then something okay. happens yeah. one day something happens that turns that world you're going in this direction and someday something happens and you're going in a different direction and then in order to deal with whatever that inciting incident created there's a whole series of steps that occur there's a whole um, you know it puts in train all these things that culminates in the climax so it, rising actually is just the things that happen between that that one day something happened and this is how it resolved itself. Okay. It, it's not the resolution, but this is how it culminated. Yeah. And and so it's just whatever happens in between. And it's kind of usually it's building to, to something. It's building to this moment. One day a client comes in and he doesn't want to talk about this, so we then he goes down and then we build to um, the, 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 the judge kind of, you know, going over his head. I mean, sometimes I can't tell what, you know, there's several climactic moments. It's, you know, it's not, mm. it's not a hard and fast science, but you, you do need dramatic tension and clim climax of some sort. Yeah. There can be a, several of them, I reckon. Um, does that help? Which, which makes it difficult when you have several, right? Because you want to have that, so it feels like a punchline and then you have that last line to give to take away um yeah and that that um because the story i've told i'm still you know still it's still in process that tightening of it comes from tightening the end because once you tighten the purpose of your story you'll tighten your climax you won't have several climaxes once i get the segue to the um or, or, or get the 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 good thing bad thing um, whether the bad thing is the judge not hearing and the good thing is the, me and the man outside having this moment, um, uh, that, that, that then I don't have so many climaxes. I have a series of rising actions to that moment. Um, so the, the purpose or the... It, it comes... You, you, you will need to refine it. I mean, um, there, there usually is one climactic moment. I'm wondering, do you mind if I share a little of this? No, no, go for it. Yeah. I'm wondering, with, in your case, if you could start setting the scene saying, well, I cut my teeth in business doing the street food <coughs> operation, and then I realised the value of working in partnership with others. I had a couple of successful business partnerships yeah. leading to this decision to branch out on, in business on my own. So you've got like the inciting incident is realising um, that it works better to work in partnership, and then you go, oh, now your climax is I'm actually going to set out in business on my own and these are the things that I'm doing. Would that sort of fit that model? And yeah. And you help to tell the story? Yeah, yeah. So the, the bit before starting the, the food business could be dropped because you're just talking about your business pathway. Yeah. Yeah? That's one, one observation. Yeah, <laughs> There's many no, ways to attack No, no, it definitely yeah. helps because you, you need to put perspective as to what to drop. Really, yeah. it's a lot. It's yeah, hard. Like, is this, a, is this is the this thing essential? that they need to hear? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just it's trial and error. Yeah. Our yeah. feedback's yeah. really helpful. You know, yeah. getting that other perspective. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's really helpful. Um, yeah. So it's good. We didn't have time for feedback, and you've got to be careful with feedback because stories are very delicate mm -hmm. little things, and you want to. Yeah. 
my question is there's a climax and uh, in marketing we are seeing uh, a lot of a drop in attention span so how to make sure that people listen to your story so what is the build up to the story so you are setting the scene inciting the incident but if i run through the example again the way the best advertisements actually get you the hook into it to make you glued to watching it you might be a great story but how to do that how to make it interesting and make them glued the first 10 seconds yeah look um i'm not a marketer you're a marketer <laughs> Um, and it depends on what, what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about video? Are we talking about uh, written words? Are you talking about a post on Facebook? Like? Consider a written written post in that case. Yeah. So I think you're. Um, I think starting with people and scene setting, like give some people something to see, and they will, and 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 then very quickly moving into action. Um, you know, we're in there. We want to know what happened. Um, but if we start with analysis and we, or we start with ideas, it's not as it's not gripping. So, so starting with a person that is in a place, okay. we can see that. We can we can relate to that. And then you're going to take us on. And then there's some action very quickly. You can do that in a sentence. And then and then we want to know what happened. Here we were on a basic premise that we wanted, willingly wanted to listen the other person out. So we were giving clean option for the other person to get us a win-win. Mm. But in mess, in real world, you won't get a win-win. Mm. They may not be interested to listen to you. They might have very less time. They may be in a rush. So in that case, do you consider giving a, a peak, a small brief version of the climax in the beginning? So that you can do it, uh, yeah. If you can hold, uh, uh, and it depends on the audience. It always depends on the audience and the context. And yes, in this situation, we're in a situation where we're giving each other time, but we're practicing. We're trying to see our story before we can shrink it. Yes. Um, before we can, you know, just uh, see what's going to work in what context. But we have to know the story well, and we have to know how to craft a story well before we can do that. Um, but there's, there's, uh, and then, and then you're starting to. Um, yeah, it's a very busy marketplace out there. Mar you know, I don't want to be a marketer. I, that's not my strength. I like, you know, you are all much better connected to the people you heard, whose stories you heard. Like, it's about relationship building. So it's not about marketing. It's really about relationship building. Um, storytelling, this kind of storytelling is about that. Um, but you can take the same story and apply it in a marketing context. But I'm not a marketer. But, y you know, you're... Then I think you, you have to start in the action, you have to go the hook you. But, but people, something happening to them, that's the best I can offer. But you probably know better than me, you're a marketer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, where were we? Yes. Uh, me. Um, yes, I found that I... And you missed all the learning. Yeah. I did miss a bit of that. But, um, but yeah, my story did change the way I, I told it. Um, uh, the second time around, I think I... For me, practice is really, really important. Um, also, preparation in terms of um, really thinking about those key um, aspects of the plot. Um, so, just even, uh, I guess, from my previous presentations, I tend to rely quite heavily on a script, which I'm trying to avoid, but I think just like what you said, is just having a general idea and, and just some keywords of what you want to talk about at each stage is going to help me um, better um, telling a story um, but yeah also I think sometimes I over analyze um, what people want to hear or how they want to hear or trying to explain too much so I've got to try and um, um, be more succinct in what I say that only comes with practice and <coughs> preparation. Um, yeah. Yeah, we tend to want to, I mean, that's why we let the story do the talking. We tend to want, I tend to want to explain everything. Yeah. But the, the, the art is actually letting the story do the explaining and, and not beating people over the head with the message all the time or, or um, yeah. It's tricky. So for me, there were a couple of things. The first one is that concept of taking things from unconscious to conscious. 
in terms of, yeah, we, of course we're telling stories all the time and looking for verbal cues because we're human and that's what humans do. You're looking for verbal visual cues, right? So that was just that real, oh yeah, right. Um, and the second big takeaway for me is, and I need to sit on thinking and learning and practice, is when do you tell a story and when do you pitch and then you <coughs> the same? And how to, diff you know, because I think I've probably been in my mind confusing the two and thinking of the, the story and the pitch as being one, but what I heard today was actually there a bit different. Yeah, to use them. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, you recently went to a pitch thing. Was there a lot of storytelling? Was there much storytelling? Um, there was. Yes, there was. In the sense of, <coughs> I can't remember how long. It was. Yeah. Right. Okay. Last year, sometime. Yeah. Okay. Probably September or something. I don't know. But it was. Um, you had a set amount of time, and yeah, so people did tell their story. Uh, had I done this first, I would have much. I've done a better job. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was a story. I mean, and, and can I answer? I've been, one of the, my mentors has suggested rather than the pitch of I help X do X because of X, she actually is, she, her thing is to tell a story. So most of the time, if I'm, if someone asks me what I do, I tell them about a client. Mm -hmm. That's how fantastically proud I am of them. So that's a story. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, but it's really small, yeah. and it's up to them if they want to find out more. So that's, um, so I have, I guess, been using it. Yeah, there's lots of different ways of approaching it, um, and you get someone who practices in business storytelling, and you'll get a different, but we've, oh, we've done what we've done, and I hope it's useful. I think having all of them. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 that's right. So we've just touched the surface. So unless there's, um, but just one word, wrap up. Sean, one word. No, no. <laughs> that's that's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great. That's not a word. <laughs> um, interesting. One story. Enlightened. Ooh. Sorry, <laughs> can I borrow that one? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to get a bit in the face then. That's my word. <laughs> Exploration. Mm -hmm. Insightful. Engaging. Fascinating. I'm a bit challenged. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and um, yeah, get on with your co-working you. or whatever you're going to do for the rest of the day. Thanks, <laughs> <so> <laughs>